Welcome to the Pathways to Stillness podcast series. I'm Dr. Gary Irwin Kenyon. I'm a gerontologist and a Tai Chi teacher. I decided to create this series after receiving many heartfelt responses to my book, Pathways to Stillness, Reflect, Release, Renew, which is available on Amazon, Indigo, and Friesen Press, and in audiobook form from Audible and iTunes. You're also invited to check out my website, which is pathwaystostillness.org. As with my book, this podcast invites you to a conversation about how it's possible to discover your own pathways to meaning, peace, and stillness, even during these times of heightened anxiety, confusion, and rapid change. We are helped on our own journey to stillness by listening to the wisdom in each other's stories. Chapter 6 in my book is titled, Finding Your Way, and that gives you guidelines as well as examples of others who have discovered meaning and stillness in their lives. Previous guests have included Thomas Moore, who among other things wrote Care of the Soul, and Dr. Bill Randall, co-founder of Narrative Gerontology. In this series, I'm in conversation with Dr. Bill Cook. Dr. Cook is a longtime friend, colleague, and kindred spirit. Bill wears several hats as a clinician, bioethicist, and director of the IRIS Center, where, among other things, he teaches a course on mindfulness and conscious living. Bill has worked with and trained with such well-known teachers as John Kabat-Zinn and Jack Kornfield. His course has been a life changer for me. I've taken the course twice and it's been very, very significant in my life. And I know for many others here in Atlantic Canada and elsewhere, we're extremely fortunate to have his medical practice at the Iris Center supported by our healthcare system. You can find out more about the Iris Center, and Iris is spelled I R I S, just like the flower, uh, at the Iris Center at www.iriscenter.ca. In this episode, we learn about the background to Bill's pathway and his discovery of mindfulness. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Gary. I'm very happy to be here. I guess it's nice that spring is happily arriving in New Brunswick, Canada, which is where we're located. Perhaps we're pleased with more light and more light in the day. Yeah, I'm particularly uh, happy to hear the... uh, red-winged blackbirds and um, other uh, creatures showing up after uh, the winter interlude for them and uh, really looking forward to our spring peepers, which will start uh, coming out of the mud in the bottom of our wetlands uh, within the next few weeks. Yeah, you've got a beautiful, uh, at the center, wonderful walking trails and ponds and so on. It's just a beautiful place. Hmm. Well, let's start. Can you tell me something of your background, kind of where you grew up and how you arrived in New Brunswick in Canada. I started off the early eight, nine years of my life in St. Catharines, Ontario. In fact, the playground for me at that early stage of my life was the escarpment, the Niagara escarpment, where uh, Brock University now is. And, you know, I really connected uh, in those early years with uh, with Mother Nature being outside and uh, uh, playing in the ravines and climbing the the escarpment and the cliffs and really grew a deep sense of connection to all things uh, nature-oriented. And uh, we then moved to Toronto. I went from a a fairly small town at that point in St. Catharines to a large city and um, nobody knew me. I was entering grade four, and I remember the first uh, uh, few days or a week or two of school leaning up against the uh, the brick of the school all by myself, feeling very lonely and left out because nobody knew me or had any interest in me. Uh, until one day, uh, somebody ran by and said, hey, Cookie, let's go play soccer. And, of course, that had been my nickname in St. Catharines, Cookie. 
Uh, and that just uh, sort of opened that um, door of connection to uh, others. And um, those early years in Toronto um, were very uh, inf influencing in my life from the context of, uh, you know, learning how to get on with others when you're not the top dog. <laughs> um, they're just such a big population that there's a big spread. And uh, uh, I had to actually have a different view of my, uh, my, myself and my capabilities, even at that young, you know, and I probably wasn't aware of it back then, but thinking back on it, I, I, uh, I remember I had to adjust the view of myself even at that uh, young age. Throughout the years growing up in Toronto, I, uh, um, again, spent a lot of time. Uh, we, we lived near a ravine where there was a creek, so I spent a lot of time outdoors in nature. I enjoyed playing sports and, and uh, uh, those sorts of things. But I also had a very, uh, again, uh, uh, natural interest in things natural. Um, biology really uh, enticed me. And early on, probably in as early as grade seven or eight, I felt I was going to be a doctor. It was just uh, what I wanted to, to do. Uh, interestingly, in those early years, it was surgery that for some reason really piqued my interest. And I was down, bound bet and determined I was going to be a surgeon. And it wasn't until I was in about uh, third year medical school that I realized it was something other than surgery uh, in medicine. Um, which was uh, interesting. I went to uh, Queens in Kingston for my um, medical training and um, was there uh, right through to the end of my internship and then went off uh, to Dalhousie University in Halifax uh, to do my plastic surgery training. So surgery was uh, ultimately what I was uh, uh, oriented to. I ended up here in Fredericton uh, at the end of my plastic surgery training. I was, you know, necessary to start looking for a place to work. And uh, I realized I, I wanted to be in a smaller type of a community where you had access to all sorts of uh, things, and but also in a community that uh, uh, had um, advantages that perhaps a, a rural community would, wouldn't have had. I needed to be in a big enough community that would support uh, a plastic surgery practice. Uh, and I, it just so happened that, uh, you know, my colleague uh, um, in Fredericton uh, was looking for uh, a second plastic surgeon to join his practice. So uh, uh, here we were and we've been here uh, ever since. So that was uh, uh, 40 years ago, almost over 40 years ago, actually. It's a, it's quite a, Quite a pleasant, I think, the whole province of New Brunswick. I didn't come from here originally either. I've been here 35 years, and it it's, continues to be a very pleasant uh, place to be. I think we're a little bit of a sleeper in Canada. Uh, we're, not a, we're not on the mainstream of a lot of things, and yet we do wonderful things and have a wonderful living environment here. Yes, it's been a wonderful place to raise my two boys and uh, for them now to uh, be raising their own families and engaged in the community in the way they are and the work that they do. So I'm very, uh, very happy being here. I find it fascinating listening to your story of how, how we come to our passion or to our interests in life. Like you say, in grade seven or eight, you already had a, an idea that you were or a good idea of being a doctor and even being a surgeon and uh, how sometimes that happens earlier in life. You can think of all kinds of reasons for that, depending on your philo philosophical <laughs> beliefs, yeah. but uh, it's quite fascinating and others don't reach that until later in life uh, or some not at all really developing a particular passion. So it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Well, you know, just to build on that, I remember my older boy, you know, as he was finishing high school, he, you know, in our conversations, he wasn't sort of talking about any particular professional bent at all. Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, poof, this is what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, he's been on that track uh, um, ever since. 
So uh, you're right. Uh, you know, sometimes we get that idea early and other times it comes uh, much later or, as you say, for some, not not at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for, uh, for myself, I was a hippie and grew up in those times and wandered around and was always curious about the meaning of life. And, and uh, gradually that turned into going back to university for a degree in philosophy and master's and PhD. And then I like to say somebody eventually started paying me for my passion. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a useful uh, turn of events yeah. for sure. <laughs> I'm interested in how you became interested in mindfulness, the, the sort of the beginnings of that and the practices you began or your however you like to, to share it with, with your spiritual life or changes in your own life. Um, even before that specific question, I think a lot of, of our audience might be interested in what do you think mindfulness is, if you wouldn't mind, uh, in your, in your, from your, your point of view. I know I hear people say, well, oh, mindfulness, stillness, what, what, what is this stuff? And mindfulness is it, supposed to be about becoming peaceful, but it sounds like your mind is full. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a huge misunderstanding and misperception, I think, about what the invitation is in this practice. And I use the word practice both as a noun and as a verb. Uh, and um, I use it in an equivalent way to using the word life and living. So mindfulness is simply being as fully aware in the moment as you can of the unfolding of your life, the experience of uh, being here now, what's arising and uh, what's passing on uh, moment by moment. Uh, the difficulty that I see a lot of people falling into is, as human beings, we're so addicted to thinking that rather than sort of being open to the awareness of an, of of life, there's the thinking about life, which creates a, whole, a huge filter within us uh, that uh, narrows our our understanding and narrows our perspective and narrows our view, uh, and generates a huge amount of desire. Uh, so if we can simply open our awareness uh, to receive what's actually here as it is. I think that uh, is the work that we're invited to uh, to connect with, or the practice, or the living that we're connect, invited to connect with. So it's really, um, would you agree? It's really a, another dimension of our of who we are besides what we call in Tai Chi, for example, the monkey mind. Yes. That this is if you if you keep trying to get somewhere just with your mind, you just end up in a hamster wheel, and this offers a an alternative to that, which is, you know, part of who we are. Yeah, ancient wisdom has always pointed toward the importance of uh, getting to know yourself. And um, if we keep looking at that and keep growing our interest and perspective and curiosity um, at the root of that, we discover awareness. And, um, you know, that's the struggle because uh, um, there's so much tangle and filtering be in, in between um, that, uh, that gets in the way. Mm -hmm. could, you, um, could you say something about how you became interested in yeah, part of in, who we are or who you are? Well, I, I can and I can actually... Um, um, I mean, I, I, as a youngster and as a teenager, I had a, a background interest in these sorts of things, although I never read about it and never studied it back when I was young. I didn't practice in the ways that I do now when I was uh, young, but it was always there as sort of a, a lean toward, if you'd like. But I remember distinctly at our first medical, medical class reunion, so that happened, I think, at about five years after our graduation. Might have been 10, but anyway. Um, so 40 years ago, roughly. We were sitting around a bunch of us uh, sharing um, our sort of stories of our practices and how life was going. And, and almost in unison, 
we all looked up and said, is this it? Is this all there is? You know, what we had been sharing is that most of us were working 100-hour weeks and had very little time or space for other important things. And this this notion of, uh, is this all there is? Is this it? I took that home with me from that reunion. And um, it was shortly after that that I, uh, I, I actually bought a couple of books on self-hypnosis and started to dabble in some of that in my uh, little bit of spare time. I took a few Tai Chi classes at uh, UNB. And, and then, of course, the things got really busy. And uh, so that stuff was there. I did a lot of reading. I started to read more broadly and not so much narrow in the medical domain and a lot more around, um, you know, spiritual practice and those sorts of things. Uh, And then in the early 90s, I started to develop some really significant physical symptoms uh, that uh, created uh, some complications or difficulties for me in my practice. I, I lost control of my wrist and and uh, my arm and had a lot of pain difficulties. Turned out I had a bunch of ruptured discs in my neck. Uh, and, um, you know, things would improve every, you know, couple of months. Uh, I'd get a flare up and then things would, uh, you know, uh, take a, a few months to get better. And there wasn't anything that they could do at the, at the time, uh, except just wait to see if things got uh, better or worse. And of course, over time, there was a deterioration and I had to stop all of the more intensive physical activities that I had been doing. And it took me about three years, three and a half years to find a, a, a physical practice that I could turn to that would help me maintain my physical conditioning. So I again went back to Tai Chi, but I also started to explore some yoga and uh, it was yoga that eventually I latched on to or it, that latched on to me. And it wasn't so much the physical aspects of yoga that latched on to me or that I latched on to. It was the spiritual and philosophical and psychological aspects of yoga. Uh, yoga as a science of awakening, if you'd like. And uh, I read very deeply. I practiced uh, at that point. We start, I started to have more formal meditation type practices and breathing practices. And then I had some surgery on my neck and uh, had a, a bit of time off of work. So I took that f- four and a half, five weeks that I had off of work to um, indulge myself with more uh, reading and study around um, uh, Advaita Vedanta and uh, yoga um, uh, philosophy. And, and then ultimately had another surgery on my neck and had to take a lot more time off during that time. So during that second time, when I had lots of extra time, I actually went off and did some yoga teacher training uh, for my own purposes, not because I wanted to teach, but just to, uh, to, to apply what I was learning to myself and really uh, began more of the esoteric uh, and uh, uh, meditative aspects of, uh, of that and the, and the breath work. And when I uh, returned to my clinical practice, it was clear that the, that the work that I was doing as a plastic surgeon, bent over, arms up, head turned, flexed, uh, was actually contributing to the disc issues that I was having in my neck. And uh, despite the surgeries, I was still having a lot of uh, pain symptoms. And so ultimately, despite uh, everything that the medical system w- had offered, the ball was in my court and I had to go back and figure out, okay, how am I going to look after myself, uh, you know, in the face of all this. So I turned to, to, to the yoga as a, as a place to help me heal. Um, but it was in the process of doing that, that I discovered, um, what we call mind body medicine. Um, and I realized that, uh, you know, this is yoga is in fact a form of mind body medicine. And I went and did some study in, in mind body medicine and have, and continue to do that. Um, so you had to, you had to, uh, sorry, interrupt, but yeah, just in case I forgot to ask so you, you had to really change your pathway. You, you, I, I, I did. Um, and so 20, 20 years ago now this year. 
I made the decision to let go of my plastic surgery practice, which I had been uh, trained and working in for uh, 30 years, to offer a mind-body medicine practice to, uh, to our medical community uh, and our patients. I was fortunate enough to uh, find support for that um, in those years with, through uh, Medicare or Department of Health. Uh, and um, that practice slowly grew. Uh, and in the pro- course of doing that, I, I sort of in, in, totally reinvented, uh, you know, my role. And uh, this, had, this encouraged a, a, a different look at myself. Meditation became, um, a yogic form of meditation became a, 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 a more concerted practice with my regular yoga uh, undertakings. Uh, interestingly, though, at that point, I still hadn't heard of mindfulness, even though I'd been already practicing it with the yoga for a decade or so. It wasn't a typical word in the in the um, in the traditional yoga community. I started when I when I wasn't able to sort of do so much constant surgery because of my uh, neck issues. I started to go off to do third world. Um, plastic surgery sessions on a charitable basis with different organizations. And uh, it's interesting how the universe uh, lines things up for you. I was traveling back on one of those trips, and one of the other participants on that trip was a young woman from New York someplace. Uh, And she had this book and uh, we had been chatting uh, together, the group of us, uh, over uh, the 10, 12 days, uh, two weeks that we had been off on this trip. And she said, you know what? I think this book would be really good for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. So she handed me this book and, uh, you know, I took it with me. Uh, and it was John Kabat-Zinn's Full Catastrophe Living. And uh, that was my introduction to, you know, what we think of now as uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness practice. And uh, I immediately, um, I took the book with me on one of my surgical trips uh, to India, uh, figuring that uh, I'll um, I'll read it, uh, you know, on the flights there and back. The flight to India is 14 hours, so you got lots of reading time. Uh, and I was going to be there for two weeks, so I'd have some downtime in the evenings to read. But I realized right away as I started to read the book uh, um, with more intention um, that uh, I couldn't just read it. It wasn't a book that was to be read. It was a book that was to be done. <laughs> you needed to practice what was in the book. Uh, so I put the book aside and then went through it. It took me quite a while to go through it and, and, you know, read a little bit, do what it says, read a little bit, do what it says, read a little bit, do what it says. And that's basically how I developed my own mindfulness practice in the early in the early years. Uh, and fortunately, John's approach includes, uh, you know, some yoga. So that was, uh, um, you know, not just the you know, mindful movement, but uh, some of the philosophies of that as well. So I went off at that point and uh, immediately did uh, did training with uh, with John Kabat-Zinn and then uh, went off and did other forms of mindfulness training. So that's basically how it all developed for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, as you say, it's amazing uh, how the universe uh, has these synchronicities when we're yeah when we're open to uh, what's happening. Yeah, I just like to mention for our audience that. Uh, uh, John Kabat-Zinn. I've noticed since the pandemic, I, and I think some of this has happened through uh, Sounds True, through through the Sounds True uh, podcast uh, series and book series. Tammy has been very assertive in getting spiritual teachers uh, out there. And John Kabat-Zinn is one of them that's become very popular now. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and he said, oh, we only have 21,000 listeners for this session. But my point is that he he started the mindfulness-based stress reduction program and you know slowly but surely from convincing the doctors in his own hospital to uh, to get onto it. But um, as we uh, as I lead you into speaking about your center, I, I just mentioned that um, we have a kind of John Cabot's in right here in New Brunswick, but he's not 
well known. You have your own program. I'm not comparing the two of you, but you are, in my estimate, and anybody I've talked to that has taken your program, taken your course, is we are very fortunate to have you here in this province and more people need to know about it. Thank you for listening to the Pathways to Stillness podcast series. My book, Pathways to Stillness, Reflect, Release, Renew, is available on Amazon, Indigo Chapters, and Friesen Press. It is also available in audiobook form from Audible, Amazon, and iTunes.